Okay, we're going live now. So hi, everyone. Welcome to our seminar today. Um, we'll have a, a talk from our speaker for around 40, 40 minutes uh, with time for questions at the end. So if you're watching on Zoom, please raise your hand and we'll come to you to ask your question or type it in the chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can type it in the chat and we'll ask it on your behalf. So today we're happy to have a seminar by Dr. Chris Stevenson from the Sedimentology Group here at Liverpool. Uh, Chris completed an undergraduate MSci degree in geology at the University of Leeds before doing a PhD on modern seafloor systems offshore Northwest Africa at the University of Southampton. Uh, he then went back to the University of Leeds to work as a postdoc in the Strat Group, where he investigated the stratigraphy of hybrid beds offshore the Gulf of Mexico and, North, and the North Sea. And after a second postdoc at the University of Manchester, uh, looking at su the subsurface interpretation of the buzzard, buzzard oil field, Chris joined the university in 2017 as a lecturer in sedimentology. Uh, his research now focuses on gravity flows, in including turbidity currents, debris flows, and mass transport events. Or, uh, In Chris's words, he works on understanding how things go downhill and stop, but yeah. underwater. <laughs> so I'll now hand over to you, Chris, uh, to talk about some new and exciting results about meteorites and mass extinctions. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, that's um, those of you that uh, sort of are familiar with what I do uh, is um, sediments, anything that goes downhill. So this is a little bit of a different flavour to what uh, I normally talk about in conferences and, you know, over coffee. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be talking about um, meteorites and mass extinctions. And the take home points will be that size doesn't matter. And this is work that I've been doing with um, Matt Pankhurst and Bev Goldwell uh, down in Tenerife, off and on now for about eight years, something like that. So this story is a real slow burner, um, <clears throat> but it doesn't make it any less dramatic and interesting. So let's, let's hop in. Come on. Oh, no. So the structure of the talk, um, it's going to be slightly, perhaps slightly different to a, a typical science presentation because this sort of work covers a variety of disciplines and approaches. So we're going to cover a lot of ground and a lot of different topics within the within the story. So a bit like a murder mystery, <clears throat> some of the threads might not be immediately obvious how they relate. But like any good murder mystery, <clears throat> all will be revealed at the end and how it all links together. So um, we're going to talk about meteorite impacts, their relationship to mass extinctions, we're going to talk about the role of um, potassium feldspar and how it affects cloud dynamics and in turn how that affects global climate and um, the stability of life on the planet. Right, so next let's kick things off then with basic um our basic premise here which is meteorite impacts have been a repeated phenomenon throughout earth's history and they are variably correlated with mass extinction events the most famous of which is the end cretaceous extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs right and this was um, this meteorite kill mechanism was made popular in the 1980s, and the paradigm of meteorites being the killer has um, 
become uh, pervasive um, to present day. So, <clears throat> what is the kill mechanism behind a meteorite impact? What actually kills life on the planet? Well, the prevailing thought on this is um, a phenomenon called impact winter. Now, impact winter is produced when um, the meteorite clobbers the earth and then it throws up loads of dust and soot and ash, loads of debris into the high into the stratosphere, atmosphere um, and troposphere. This, these particulates, you know, get carried around um, the globe and uh, block out incoming solar radiation, which means sunlight. And so the world is plunged into <clears throat> um, much darker conditions on the planet's surface. And this basically cuts the legs out of photosynthetic plants, which then has catastrophic um, knock-on effects throughout um, a variety of ecosystems across the planet. So that is the prevailing kill mechanism um, associated with meteorite impacts and mass extinctions. So the key thing with this kill mechanism is that it is geologically instantaneous. We should have an impact, light of dust and soot, everything dies. Okay, so this kill mechanism should have a nice correlation with the nature of the extinction that it's related to, i.e. everything should die instantaneously. There should also be a nice correlation between the size of impact and the extinction intensity. And that's an intuitive um, connection between the bigger the impact, the more dust, the less light gets through, the worse the impact winter is going to be. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what we did is we thought we could test this, right? So what, what I'm showing you here is a suite of 36 meteorite impacts um, that are over the last 600 million years, anywhere between 10 kilometers in diameter up to you know, 90 kilometers in diameter, which is the KPG impact, which is the right big one. And so on the y-axis, on the left-hand side, that's a transient crater diameter. So the higher it is, the bigger the, the impact. And then on the x-axis, we've got <clears throat> 600 million years on the left to present day on the right. And our colored dots, uh, colored circles, are our meteorite impacts. And the size of the circle is scaled to the size of the impact. So the bigger the circle, the bigger the impact. All right. So now what we can do is we can compare this to the um, fossil record of extinction intensity. So same x-axis. But this time what we're doing is we're looking at extinction intensity through geological time, all right? <clears throat> and so on the y-axis, we have the amount of um, genre that are um, becoming extinct between 
different bio no, biostratigraphic stages. And the black line that looks like it's got little stalactites is a measure of the extinction intensity at a particular biostratigraphic stage through geological time. So the longer or the, the more down the stalactite, the more severe the extinction intensity is at that particular stage. Okay, so what we can see in this um, sort of visual correlation is that whilst we have some, you know, temporal correlations between, you know, some of the big impacts like the KPG, Chicksaw Club impact with the end of the dinosaurs, we also have quite big impacts that are not associated with uh, extinction intensities uh, elevated at all. In fact, the fourth largest impact um, is associated with no change in um, extinction intensity from background. All right. So <clears throat> at least visually, does it seem to, to, to hold up bigger equals worse uh, extinction intensity? And in fact, when we do the statistics, um, you know, the computer says no. There is no correlation at all between meteorite impacts in general and mass extinction events. And indeed, there's no correlation between the size of meteorite impact and extinction intensity or the severity of extinction. Okay, so let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail, pick out some examples. Um, here's another way of, of looking at it. This plot shows on the y-axis extinction intensity um, a slightly different way of measuring it, but it's the same, same thing. And on the x-axis, we have our transient crater diameter with the size of the circle being scaled to the size of the impact. And so what we can see here is <clears throat> generally the bigger the circle, no, there's, there's no real relationship between the size of the circle and how high up it is uh, on this plot. And that's what we would expect to see if size mattered in, um, in our kill mechanism. So, you know, here's an example, the Cretaceous Chicksaw Club impact, relatively high extinction rates, um, big impact. But then we have two quite small impacts associated with severe extinction rates as well. So that's weird. And then we can look at two of, you know, well, the fourth and fifth largest impacts aren't associated with any um, increase in um, extinction rate at all. In fact, one's even associated with diversification. So size doesn't really matter. And this kind of leads us quite neatly onto the question of, well, hang on. If the size of the impact doesn't matter, then what's going on? And we thought about this for a long time and <clears throat> we thought about it from a different angle and decided to try and understand whether the mineralogy of the rocks these meteorites were hitting might be a better um, parameter to understand the effects on the biosphere. And so what my um, 
what my colleagues did, uh, Matt and Bev, is they looked at um, a particular mineral, potassium feldspar, and um, reconstructed how much potassium feldspar was contained in um, each of the ejector blankets, so of the, of the meteorite impacts. So <clears throat> when the meteorite hits, all of that dust gets thrown up into the atmosphere, and then that then rains out and then settles out onto the Earth's surface. So that's called an ejector blanket. And so what Matt and Bev did in this nice paper in the John Sock of London is they, they calculated the size of the impact, estimated the volume of material to be excavated from that impact, used a numerical model to basically place concentric rings of deposition around the impact site, and then they used the um, potassium feldspar contents of the rocks that that impact hit to make an assessment of how much potassium feldspar covered the Earth's surface after a meteorite impact has, uh, has hit. All right. And so don't get hung up too much on whether this analysis is you know, realistic. What it allows us to do is it allows us to compare between impact events through geological time. And that's the key, um, the key strategy here. We can compare the amount of potassium feldspar, sort of dust, if you will, covering the Earth's surface after every impact through geological time in a kind of quantitative way. So <clears throat> when we do that, it unlocks a completely different story. Here's our, you know, bigger one. And now what I'm going to say is our colours represent the amount of potassium feldspar um, on the Earth's surface after each impact. So the warmer the purple or pink, <clears throat> the more potassium feldspar is on the Earth's surface. And the colder the colour, the less potassium feldspar um, is there. And so what we've done here is we've correlated in colour the meteorite impact with the extinction um, record. And we've coloured in the extinction record as a function of how much potassium feldspar um, the meteorite deposited across the Earth's surface. And what you can see, at least visually, is that every time we have a mass extinction or a severe extinction episode, it's associated with a nice pink colour, which means a meteorite impact with lots of, oh, that's spread lots of potassium feldspar across the Earth's surface. Conversely, <clears throat> we can see um, the blue colours where meteorites have hit and there's been no change in extinction intensity. So when we run the stats on this properly, this gets pretty exciting. Well, I mean, statistically, statistics aren't exactly, you know, really exciting, but scientifically speaking, you know, speaking, it's very exciting. So what you see here is the train tracks are geological time with 167 biostratigraphic substages demarcated. The top line, I'm uh, sorry, the, the big thick black 
the door stops along along that, those train tracks are mass extinction events through time, 23 in total. The, 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 pink, <coughs> the pink pegs, the arrows pointing down, <coughs> are potassium feldspar rich ejector blankets from meteorite impacts. And the gray ones on the bottom are potassium feldspar poor ejector blankets. Now what you see when you do the stats is that there is a one for one correlation between potassium feldspar rich ejector blankets and mass extinction events. Every single time a meteorite produces a potassium feldspar rich ejector blanket, it's correlated with a mass extinction event. And every time there's a meteorite impact that's low in potassium feldspar, nothing really happens. So statistically speaking, this is a compelling um, correlation. Every time we have potassium feldspar rich ejector blankets, mass extinction. But every time it's a low potassium feldspar ejector blanket, life is pretty stable. All right. So this plot now looks a bit different if I say, Instead of looking at the size of the circles, look at the color. And the color here is telling you in pink and purple, which impacts are high in potassium feldspar, and in the blue, which are low in potassium feldspar. And you could clearly see this beautiful demarcation between extinction intensity and the amount of potassium feldspar in the ejector blanket. Good results. So, <clears throat> it's rock mineralogy that matters, and in particular, the amount of potassium feldspar it has. So, I can hear you all on mute. That's great, Chris, but Potassium feldspar is hardly known for its toxicity, is it? It's almost ubiquitous in the rock cycle and across the surface of the earth. And in fact, the most it does chemically is weather into clay. So the question is, how can potassium feldspar be so destructive to life? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because to answer that, we need to talk about clouds. So, clouds are fundamentally composed of either water droplets or ice particles. And small particles in the atmosphere can act as um, catalysts for ice nucleation. And these are called ice nucleating particles. You know, it's intuitive. And the composition of clouds um, is dictated by temperature and the presence of ice nucleating particles. So, without ice nucleating particles, clouds um, nucleate ice particles at about minus 36 degrees centigrade Celsius. <clears throat> and that's relatively high altitude. And so, temperatures warmer than that and lower altitudes, you get progressively more water droplet dominated clouds until much lower in the troposphere, 
you get one to two droplets dominating clouds in their entirety. So if we add potassium feldspar aerosols into the atmosphere, potassium feldspar is the most powerful ice nucleating particle that we know about. And <clears throat> it greatly reduces or warms the critical temperature that ice can form in clouds from minus 36 all the way down or all the way up to minus 18 degrees C. And so that means that with the presence of potassium feldspar particles in the atmosphere, you can generate um, icy or mixed phased cloud at much lower altitudes and at warmer temperatures. Okay, great. So, why is that important? The composition of cloud fundamentally affects their reflectivity or their albedo of solar radiation. And the more ice particles that are contained within cloud, the less reflective they are. So the more ice um, the clouds contain, the less their albedo. And so for ice dominated clouds at high altitude, they let in almost all solar short uh, shortwave incoming solar radiation and um, reflect long wave infrared radiation from the Earth's surface. So they act as a warming force on the Earth's climate. Mixed phase cloud with a bit of ice and a bit of water has more albedo, but still lets in a lot of solar radiation um, and affects a warming force on the climate. And then when we have water dominated clouds, these are the, the clouds that reflect a lot of the incoming solar radiation and act as a cooling force on the planet. Okay. So, <clears throat> what does this mean for our meteorite impact story? Well, cloud albedo is a fundamental uh, control on climate in the present day. And so, if clouds have a reduced albedo, that means we can have a warmer planet. The reduced albedo effect also has a knock-on effect to the climate system, whereby if you warm the planet, you produce more evaporation and then more water vapour and more cloud. That in turn should um, produce more cloud cover and more albedo, which reflects more solar radiation and cools the planet. But if these clouds are icy clouds, that cooling feedback is suppressed and we can warm the planet more and more. So what this means is with potassium feldspar in our atmosphere, <coughs> the atmosphere can warm faster and to higher temperature for a given greenhouse gas concentration. And that spells all sorts of bad for um, the biosphere. So let's put this all together in a kind of um, relatively simple model. We've got our climate equilibrium state where we don't have a, any effective ice nucleating particles in the atmosphere and clouds reflect lots of solar radiation and they, they're bathed. Uh, nicely behaved. 
We have our meteorite impact, patrol. Our impact winter is triggered, but the impact winter only lasts for months, maybe even up to a year, before those particles settle out of the atmosphere onto the Earth's surface. With low potassium bounce bar in, in that material, our impact ejector blanket settles onto the Earth's surface and the climate system returns to its equilibrium state. Clouds are not affected. Maybe there's some short-term damage to ecosystems, but largely uh, life can recover. However, if, those, if that um, dust and ejector material is rich in potassium feldspar, the ejector blanket covering the Earth's surface <coughs> introduces um, potassium feldspar aerosols <coughs> into the troposphere, which change the cloud composition to icy clouds. You let in loads of solar radiation and warm the planet and cause knock-on feedback to the global climate um, uh, equilibrium state. The other important point about this is that this potassium feldspar effect will be pronounced for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of years, or million up to me, a million years, and will be progressively diminish as that potassium feldspar is weathered out into clay on the Earth's surface. Right? So, <clears throat> This might explain why there is such a variable ecological response to meteorite impacts and the extinction rates. Some are sharp, some are progressive, and the recoveries out of meteorite impacts are variable in how they do it. Some are progressive, some are stepped, you know. So, this model explains a lot more than, um, than the previous paradigm. So there are the cascading effects for life. Um, if we fundamentally affect the atmospheric function in this way. So there's lots of potential kill mechanisms available that might interact or act alone. There's potential UV, UV exposure um, <clears throat> from ozone de depletion, which has recently been proposed for the Devonian mass extinction. <clears throat> we might have um, changing rainfall patterns, for example. Um, icier clouds have a much shorter shelf life than um, water droplet clouds, so they rain out faster. So this might be particularly problematic for continental interiors, you know, and so the larger supercontinents, Pangaea, for example, if we had icy clouds, the interior of Pangaea would be starved of rain and water. So icy clouds would fundamentally affect the hydrological cycle. And climate sensitivity would be increased uh, to external greenhouse gas forces like large these provinces. Right? So there's a variety of um, kill mechanisms that this model sort of opens up. So coming in on, on large these provinces, which have long been argued as a real killer for a variety of mass extinctions through time. So when we look at large these provinces, um, they are variably 
associated with mass extinctions. Some are, some are not. And the largest, or one of the largest, in, much like meteorites, or meteorite impacts, one of the largest igneous provinces is associated with relatively stable um, ecological conditions. So, once again, this problem raises its head with why do you have a variable correlation with what you're arguing is a kill mechanism? Well, it's interesting to note that every large igneous province that is associated with a mass extinction event is also associated with a meteorite hit that's rich in potassium feldspar. And we had a talk in this seminar series um, a few moons ago now about the decan traps and that actually it's a bit weird that only a third of the volume of the decan traps were erupted before the mass extinction took place. And the rest of it, the volume occurred after the mass extinction. And so there were questions raised about why um, only a third of the decan traps caused or was associated with this mass extinction. And so I would argue that the increased climate sensitivity from potassium feldspar rich ejector blankets could cause these large igneous provinces to become lethal agents to the biosphere. <clears throat> so I'd like to end with basically a summary and to argue that we should rethink meteorite impacts. The size of the impact doesn't matter. And in fact, I would argue the impact itself doesn't really matter in terms of the stability of the biosphere. Rather, it is the production of a potassium feldspar rich ejector blanket that causes serious damage to the biosphere. And it does that by fundamentally affecting the composition of clouds. And that in turn affects uh, climate function causing um, or potentially causing a whole range of cascading effects including increased climate sensitivity to external factors for example large igneous provinces so changes in greenhouse gas concentrations and indeed changes in solar radiation so melancholic cyclicity and when we understand meteorite impacts like this, many of the variable correlations between different skill mechanisms might start to make sense. It's not one kill mechanism, but then the interaction uh, between these, these factors that causes the devastation. Thanks very much. I have to apologise for my uh, my voice. It's time to go. Well, thanks, Chris. That was a really, really fascinating <coughs> seminar. So we can take questions now. Are there any questions in the Zoom chat or on YouTube? I'm happy to be um, to be heckled by non-believers, large igneous province enthusiasts. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Leo and Andy came popped up at the same time. <laughs> uh, Leo, go for it. Thanks, Randy. Uh, yeah, great, great talk, Chris. And yeah, I love the, the slides and all the uh, the little effects and everything. Uh, so really good. Thanks. Um, one thing that I, that I I don't know if I didn't catch her, if you didn't mention, but um, so I, I imagine the Feld's Park comes from whatever rock was there where the the impact site was. It's the target rock, yeah. That's right. right. Okay. So it's not coming from the meteorite itself. It's mostly no. like where it hits on Earth that matters. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. So <laughs> we did we did look at the meteorites compositions, but um, it's serendipity where meteorites hit and therefore the composition of the impact. And you see the correlation, right, which is a one for one. And so it doesn't appear that the meteorite composition in S meteorites are all the same composition. Um, has much bearing on um, on that devastation. Yeah, but it was picked up in review. That yeah, because mm -hmm. pyroxene is a another very strong ice nucleating particle. So it's thought that meteorites might might contain a lot of pyroxene. So it would only enhance the problem. I think. Thanks. Uh, can I ask you a, a quick question? Yeah. Um, hi, Chris. So, yeah, very, very nice talk for it, very stimulating. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a large igneous province believer, but I'm aware of the arguments in particular of seeing, you know, Vincent Cortilla has got some very nice one-to-one -one plots of large igneous provinces in that situation, so. Um, but I, I suppose, well, I suppose my broad question is, why does it have to be just one thing? You know, you've got the you've got the KT correlating with the biggest meteorite impact that mm -hmm. we have on, on record. And we've got the, the PT correlating with the biggest continental flood vessel yeah. um, on, on record. And yeah, so, so, you know, can't it, you know, and some of these things, <coughs> you know, and the, the PT, the, the KT coincided, the PT yeah. you're saying coincided. I wasn't aware of this, this big this big K feldspar blanket at the time, but you know, could it not just be a combination and when these things happen together? That's, well, that's, that, that's, that's exactly the argument, right? Which is um, the reason you've never heard of a lot of these meteorite impacts is because they're too small. And so they get discounted on grounds that, well, they're too small, so they don't matter. And, you know, the big, the big event is studied intensively and, I think that's exactly where I was going with this. Um, you know, the potential for for a variety of kill mechanisms, because every time you have a large igneous province that's associated with mass extinction, it's also associated with a potassium feldspar-rich injector blanket, and my. My feeling, I mean, I argue it more, more scientifically in the paper, but if you do that, you increase the climate sensitivity to greenhouse gas concentration rises. And you remove a lot of the, the stabilizing feedbacks in the climate system. And, and so, when we had that talk about the decant traps a while ago, um, where the paleo map showed that only a third of the volume of the decan was erupted before you had the KPG impact and then the mass extinction event. That to me makes <clears throat> a lot of sense that the climate became suddenly sensitized to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations from the decan and it became catastrophic. Whereas before, the Earth could buffer that, that sort of greenhouse gas increase. Um, but I absolutely agree. I mean, there's lots of arguments between one or the other, but I think it's a concert, definitely a concert, yeah. The question is, when one of these things hits and there isn't a large East province, what's the kill mechanism that's associated with it? You know, is it just a vague global warming, ocean acidification? But I don't know. Um, so that's why I mentioned the Antivonian, you know, UV, B radiation killer. Um, so there are lots of, lots of options, basically. But there's a very weak geomagnetic field in the late Devonian as well. Where does publishing on that? 
<laughs> and so, but this fire, like, but I like this model better than, you know, saying my model replaces, you know, this kill mechanism. Actually, it doesn't. It, it sets a platform by which other models can pl plug in and actually it explains a lot more than, than, you know, just one, one thing. So, <clears throat> yeah, I agree with you, Andy, yeah. Okay, th thanks, Chris. Earlier in your talk, you mentioned that some events actually led to a stabilized ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is what what is why is that? Is that to do with the the minerals in the ejection blanket as well? No, so I think it's if you took out the meteorite impact, you would just see a stable fossil record that might be diversifying or it might be you know narrowing in its you know the number of genre so i'm not saying that the meteorite impact caused diversification i mean it might have done but what's more likely is that it just didn't do anything and the biology just carried on doing what it was going to do you know <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm not saying that, like the Manicougan uh, impact, which was the fourth biggest, so it's like 40, hang on, you're not Andy, anyway, <laughs> um, that's, that's like 35 to 40 kilometres diameter, so that chucked up a lot of dust and a massive ejector blanket, global ejector blanket. But it didn't do anything to the extinction intensity. So it's just, you know, my point was just that you can't have it both ways. You can't say impacts make this huge impact winter, everything dies. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't work like that, but we'll just ignore those. You can't have it both ways. Okay, so it just had no effect, really. It just had no effect. Right, okay. Thank you. I <laughs> uh, see Janine's got her hand up. You've got Andy big in Mark too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that was a really interesting talk. Thanks so much, Chris, and really yeah. nice to hear about um, what you've been working on. Um, yeah. I wondered a little bit about um, so you've sort of, you know, you're sort of looking over geological time scales, but I guess yeah. part of the reason for doing the work is thinking about what happens in the future if there's a, a big meteor impact. And, and I wondered whether there are uh, maps of the Earth which um, take the rock that the, um, the bolide goes into, into consideration. And so, you know, if, uh, if uh, yeah, so like to, if, it go, if it goes in the ocean, then it will be this kind of size or it needs to be this particular size to have effect. And I wondered whether the, the rock that's being hit or the country rock is sort of taken into account in those kind of um, hazard models for any Yes, years? well, so in the uh, paper by Mount Bev, um, that set the platform for this work. That's it. That's kind of exactly what they do, but through geological time. <clears throat> so they do the plate reconstructions, get the stratigraphy of the impact rocks, and then um, map or reconstruct the blast or the ejector blanket. So the, the interesting thing in the future it's not necessarily so much about if we're going to be hit by a meteorite, although I definitely hope, I, I hope we get run up by NASA when that happens, you know, rather than Bruce Willis. But Elon Musk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. Um, but actually, um, human effects on the Earth's surface at the moment are akin to a meteorite impact, geologically speaking, because we are digging up huge amounts of material from the earth and we are processing it into dust in various forms. And so 
in the present day, potassium feldspar is in trace abundance as a mineral aerosol, but it still has a profound influence on cloud physics. So, you know, a throwaway comment at the end of the paper really is, are we doing what meteorites have only done previous? Um, I mean, it might be a bit sensationalist, but I agree with you in terms of the hazard map stuff, which is, I don't think it matters really if it hits the ocean or the earth as such. If it's big enough, it won't matter if it's got a kilometre of water to soften the blow. Um, but I suppose with you know, a 10 kilometre impact, yeah, it does matter where it is. Yeah. Thanks for watching. As a maps, all right. I was thinking more about super volcanoes actually in the future or big, big eruptions because um, if you have more silicic eruptions with more potassium feldspar, I would anticipate that they would cause more impact on the climate. So I'm trying to write a grant at the moment to, um, to look into that, um, not helped by the current UK, European mm -hmm. collaboration status, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, so a lot of that, a lot of those um, um, effects, they're often just thinking about sulfur, really, aren't they? So that's, that's right, the, the poisonous, toxic aerosols. Mm -hmm. And no one, no one thinks about the benign minerals that get thrown up in the atmosphere. So, and if, if you have more silicic um, eruptions, they're more likely to be explosive and, and eject the material higher into the atmosphere as well so they're more likely to affect cloud change so um that's that's where i was thinking rather than defense against meteorites in the future but it's uh, i like it i like the attention of the nsa on that thanks very much Chris. yeah yeah Okay, I think we've come to the end of the hour, so so we'll end things here. But thanks again to Chris for a brilliant talk, and thanks everyone for coming. Uh, feel free to to hang around in the Zoom chat if you want to to have some continued discussion. Yeah, happy to happy to be berated. <laughs> but to everyone else, bye. Thanks, Chris. See you soon. Good, uh, good, to see you. good to see you guys. Bye bye. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks. See you.